right, so as per request, we'll do some spinal track anatomy, and then we're going to cover the top. So, let's get going. So it's really, I I'm not highlighting way too much. All I want you guys to focus on, like there's a white matter, gray matter, obviously. And then the gray matter has its several parts. One is the dorsal horn, which is all things that do with sensory and then eventual that do with motor. Um, and just Clark's nucleus, which comes back towards the very end of my lecture today. Um, that's especially the spinal tract lecture part. Um, it's just basically contains sensory neurons and they convey proprioception to the cerebellum. So proprioception being limb positioning sense. Um, so that will come later in my lecture. And the other thing I wanted to cover is the white matter has tracts or fasciculus. They're both kind of interchangeable. They're both almost the same thing. Um, and what makes up a spinal nerve? Does anybody know? Oh, so a spinal nerve, like a perineurium, epineurium. No, I'm not talking more specific. Just saying that every spinal nerve has a dorsal root and a ventral root. Oh. And they're both on both. So that's essentially what I'm covering in that course. Any questions about this? This is just general slide anatomy. Mm -hmm. uh, moving forward. So, so this is your dorsal horn. So dorsal horn have cells that are pseudo unipolar. So this is a pseudo unipolar cell. They look like what they say is lollipops on a stick. Um, so how do we classify sensory fibers in dorsal root? You can classify them in two ways. If, they're, um, if the root comes from a sensory receptor in a muscle, they have to have a Roman numeral. So one, one A, one B, two, three, or four. And if it's coming from the skin, it's A beta, A delta, or C fibers. So um, again, as you see, the medial division and the lateral division have proprioception, and then there's like a 1A or 1B fibers for proprioception. Touches, uh, you have two, but then you can also get the A beta fibers. So depends on where it's coming from, it's uh, separated into its own sense. Um, all the pictures in this PowerPoint today come from the Kaplan lecture because that's where I've learned uh, anatomy for neuro and I haven't switched to anything, anything else. So, um, All right, so the muscle spindle, again, are stretch 1A receptors um, and muscle spindles are basically stretch receptors. And then the Golgi tendon organ are basically force receptors that act by shortening of the muscle. Um, so you will talk about these two on and off throughout the next few slides. And the largest myelinated um, are the Roman numeral one dorsal roots. So these guys are the lo largest myelinated throughout the body. And proprioception fibers, as you can see here, they basically um, skip uh, synapse in the dorsal horn and they go straight to the, either the ventral horn or straight up to the cortex while as like lateral division and sharp pain and dull fibers they're smaller as you could also see the difference in the size these are look a little thicker than here so these guys will actually synapse onto the dorsal root or dorsal horn while these guys will completely avoid the dorsal horn and go to the ventral horn or basically enter the dorsal columns, which we'll talk about later. So any questions about this slide? All right. All right, so the ventral horn, uh, what we're gonna quickly talk about here uh, is that the alpha motor neurons make a muscle contract. And so you have alpha and gamma motor axons basically in the ventral root. So the alpha motor neurons make muscles contract while the gamma motor neurons increase sensitivity to the muscle spindles. So gamma is basically sensitivity to stretch, essentially. Um, so the one thing that I want to talk about here, looking at the flexors and extensors from the trunk to the hand, is that ventral horn neurons that are more lateral are innervate the distal muscles while the medial on the neuron do the proximal muscles. So 
Does that make sense? So the ventral horn neurons that are lateral are going to do the distal muscles and the ones that are more medial are going to do basically the proximal muscles. And in the ventral horn, there are things called Renshaw cells. Basically, Renshaw cells are there to release glycine and provide feedback inhibition to shut down alpha motor neurons. So that's their normal job. So when you're affected by tetanus toxin, it causes spasm and lockjaw because basically these Renshaw cells aren't working. Um, so they cause a continuous fire. So essentially the the thing from this that I want you guys to take is any sort of pathologies here. So make sure you know that and why these happen in the ventral horn. And we're going to talk about all the tracks coming up. So any questions about this? Um, sorry, I guess I kind of missed like, so Renshaw sells just the whole idea of the tetanus toxin. Right. So other pathology are they associated with? Well, I mean, just in this case is what I'm kind of, kind of saying is that since the alpha motor neurons speak, you contract, Mm -hmm. um, the job of the Renshaw cells is to inhibit alpha motor neurons. So okay. basically they inhibit the contractions. But okay. if you're affected by this toxin, it basically does not do that. It avoids that, and then it causes these spasms and lockjaw, okay. which are the symptoms of tetanus toxin. Okay, so we'll move on to our first one, which is going to be the uh, corticospinal tract. Um, essentially, in a nutshell, what you need is uh, for any motor voluntary movements, um, you need to have two. So you need a, a two neuron system. So you need to have an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. So as you can see here, you have an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. Um, so that's for a voluntary contraction. However, uh, every body also has a reflex con uh, conception. So reflexes, meaning when you do a reflex test with a reflex hammer, what are you actually doing? You're basically, you're stimulating the sensory neuron and then the lower motor neuron is acting back. So it's also a two neuron system here. So you have a sensory neuron and a lower motor neuron. So we'll talk about this in a few minutes, but let's talk about the corticospinal tract in itself. So you have an upper motor neuron that's basically in the motor cortex, right? So motor cortex is gonna descend ipsilateral until it gets to the caudal, um, uh, it descends ipsilateral through the internal capsule. So make sure you know that it descends through the internal capsule until it reaches the caudal medulla spinal cord junction where it desiccates, decusates, um, and that's called pyramidal decusation. So it's basically going to cross at the caudal medulla, and then it's going to descend contralateral. So these are your upper motor neurons that are coming from the motor cortex. They're coming down the same side until the caudal medulla, and they're switching sides and going contralateral. So that makes up the cortical spinal tract. And then they enter with the lower motor neurons to cause any sort of voluntary contraction that you may have. Um, is that okay? So basically, your upper motor lateral to the neuron. So if anything, make sure you get that point that the upper motor neurons are contralateral to the lower motor neurons until they reach this, and then they're the same side. And usually, the upper motor neuron axons are in a tract, while the lower motor neuron axons are in a nerve. So lower motor neurons will obviously work with the specific nerve of that you're innervated by. So it could be the median nerve, it could be the femoral nerve. Um, so lower motor neurons go in nerves while upper motor neurons come down in tracks. And um, lower motor neurons are ipsilateral to the innervated muscle. So they're on the same side of the muscle. Um, and these basically help you again with the voluntary contraction of movements. So. Any questions about the corticospinal tract? So, okay, so let's move on to these muscle spindles or muscle re stretch reflex. Essentially, when you sense, uh, 
do a stretch reflex on a muscle, it's basically uh, stretching, essentially. So your muscle spindle 1A fibers uh, from the muscle go into the ventral horn and the muscle spindle, and basically the lower motor neuron, which or the alpha, which is also another name for uh, ventral horn, will come back and innervate the muscle. So this next slide kind of helps you a little bit better. Um, so the muscle spindles are activated by increase in muscle stretch. So you hitting a hammer, basically you're activating the lower the muscle spindle nerves to go down to your ventral horn and cause the lower motor neurons will then come out of the ventral root and cause a muscle contraction. Now, here it's important. If I continuously keep contracting my muscle, it's going to cause hyper, um, hyper reflexia, right? So what is inhibiting that continuous movement of the muscle? is going to be your upper motor neurons. The upper motor neurons have a net inhibitory effect on the muscle stretch reflexes, so it does not keep reflexing a lot. So if you lose this upper motor neuron or have an upper motor neuron lesion, that's why you're going to see signs and symptoms of hyperreflexia. Um, and we'll cover that in a second. And as far as the Golgi, if the muscles are overly contracting, for the Golgi tendon, um, there is an inhibition, basically. Um, if the muscles are overly contracting, you stimulate the Golgi tendon too much, and it causes an inhibition, and that all of a sudden the muscle will basically relax. So that's the inhibitory signal right here with the 1B fiber. So if you're continuously contracting and it's too much contraction, your muscle is basically going to stop working, and that's due to the Golgi tendon inhibition. So in an upper motor neuron disease, both reflexes become hyperactive because you don't have an inhibition process. You're, you can't stop it in any way. So does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> I'm assuming that that makes sense. Wait, just to clarify, so you mm -hmm. get the reflex and it goes up through the 1A fiber mm -hmm. and then passes through the Golgi tendon to the lower motor neuron or is that only for no so it's it's the golgi tendon is basically the force right so it's this is due to muscle stretching this is due to muscle force so this will only be activated when there's too much like force force meaning i'm assuming contractions so once you're contracting over a long period of time you know this is there's no way to really test the Golgi tendon. I mean, there is, but there isn't. Most of the time, we're just testing the muscle strength. But the muscle spindle, so when you're hitting the hammer, you're only testing the muscle spindle. So making sure that, I one, you're getting that one reflex, right? So your lower motor neuron is working, and it's reflexing and kicking out. And two, it's not doing it too much where it's, like, constantly doing it, and the upper motor neurons are still working. So that's, another, that's what I'm what you're testing here, if that if that's what you're asking. Okay, so it just comes in if you're reflexing too much and just blocks it. Right, yeah. Okay. So it's, yeah, essentially. The upper motor neurons is inhibiting it from doing it too much. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, so we're going to take a different view, and hopefully this might kind of help you understand as well. So... Um, Obviously, you have the upper motor neurons that are coming from the cerebral cortex and the brainstem. They're going to come down to where, where they're going to decussate at the um, medulla, caudal medulla, right? So they're going to keep coming down until they get to basically the caudal medulla, and then they're going to decussate to the opposite side. Um, so if you have a lesion here, as it says, would result in a spastic weakness that's ipsilateral, and below the lesion, right? So because this is an upper motor neuron that I'm affecting from anything with the lower motor neurons down below, that lesion will be spastic weakness that is ipsilateral because it's already crossed and below the lesion. Does that make sense? 
Okay, so here, if your result, if you're basically cutting off the lower motor neurons, it would result in flaccid weakness, that's FC lateral, at, at the level of the lesion because you're only cutting off the lower motor neuron at that one lesion or at that level. You're not affecting anything below. You still have lower motor neurons down below, you still have lower motor neurons up above, and your upper motor neurons are still working. So it would only affect at the level of the lesion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So essentially, um, we're going to take this and add this to this. So at a lesion here or here, you're going to get spastic paresis contralateral and below the lesion because everything below or the lower upper motor neurons are not getting to basically stop. Uh, so you're going to get spastic paresis, which is basically just like weakness. Um, yeah, muscles can't can't move muscles and they become stiff and rigid. Um, and it's going to be contralateral and below. If you have a lesion at C, you're going to have spastic weakness, FC lateral and below the lesion. Again, lower motor, upper motor neurons affected here, and it's going to be FC lateral, same side, and below the lesion. Because this has been crossed, that's why it's contralateral. And at D and E, you're going to get flaccid paralysis, ipsy lateral, and at the level of the lesion because they're at just the lower motor that innervates the specific muscle. All right, so as we know, um, with lower motor neuron lesions, you're going to see flaccid paralysis, A reflexia, um, you're going to see fasciculations, and then eventually will lead to atrophy of the muscles because you lose voluntary muscle movements because you can't basically innervate those muscles. Um, with an upper motor neuron disease, you're going to get spastic paresis, hyperreflexia. You're going to see a Babinski sign. And these clasp knife reflexes are usually due to the Golgi tendon organ. Um, that's typically where you're going to see that um, effect. The clasp knife reflex are associated specifically with the Golgi tendon reflex, which are due to force. Um, you're going to get atrophy of the muscle that are not being used and decrease of the speed of the voluntary muscles. So those are some of the symptoms that you're going to see. Um, any questions with this one? If not, we can move on because this was the only motor one. So we'll move on to the sensory ones. Sorry, second, I lost my page. Can you explain what the cast knife reflex is? Yeah, so from what I've learned, the cl uh, the cast knife reflex, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but it is associated with this one, the Golgi tendon organ. Um, and I'm assuming it's because you're losing this um, inability or this intervention in an upper motor neuron. Basically, it's stopping it. So the muscles become really loose, and I, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but if Pete knows or Tulsi knows, they can help me with that. So what was the question again? The class knife reflex and why. I mean, I know that it's only associated with the Golgi tendon organ, but I'm not exactly sure. I can look it up. Nah, I don't remember. <clears throat> No. Can I answer that question at the end, Divya? Yeah, that's fine. I'll come back to that because it's on my other screen. Okay, so we'll talk about general sensory pathways and then we'll talk about specific sensory pathways uh, moving forward. So, um, Okay, so general sensory pathways, you're going to have, instead of the two neuron system that we saw in the motor pathway, we're going to have a three neuron system. So here, your first neuron is going to be at the dorsal root ganglion, right? So receptor and dorsal root ganglion. And then the second neuron is usually um, right ipsilateral, typically ipsilateral to the first neuron. So it's going to be on the same side. And then right after the second neuron, it's going to cross to the midline. 
of the body and then go either in a track or a lemiscus um, and go to the third order neuron, which is always going to be the thalamus of the VPL. So this is just a general idea of a sensory and how many neurons there are. So you have three instead of the typical two. Um, so first order neuron is a sensory ganglion, second is in the CNS, and then this is where it's going to cross the midline, and then the third is in the thalamus. So just keep that in mind as we move forward. So let's talk about the dorsal column. So dorsal column's function is proprioception, fine touch, vibration, pressure, and two-point discrimination. So that's what dorsal columns do. That's what you need to know. Um, so when you're, this usually comes at the A beta or 1A or 1B fibers. So your first receptors, essentially your sensory nerve endings are going to go through the pseudo unipolar cells and they're going to go to where? They're going to go to the dorsal root ganglion, which then are going to either hit the, tr meet the tracks of the fasciculus, gracilis, or cuneatus. So the fasciculus, gracilis is basically the lower limbs. So anything below T T6 um, is going to go up the track until the medulla. And the fasciculus cuneatus is upper limbs, so anything above T5. So which one of these two will be the longer ones? The cuneatus or gracilis? Cuneatus. What's that? The top one. Mm, so why... The answer is fasciculus gracilis will be longer because it has to travel from anything below T6 up to T6, but then it also has to continue to carry the senses, the fiber senses, all the way to the medulla. So they will be longer. The cuneatus will start getting innervation or start receiving sensory information at T5 and take everything up to the medulla. So they're very short. So gracilis is the longer one. And these ones also come... So if you're looking at um, a slide, and I have this picture towards the end, but if you're looking at the dorsal columns basically here, and this is your gray matter. Sorry, I suck at drawing, so you're going to have to excuse my drawing. Um, your first one is going to be your fasciculus gracilis, and then the second one will be your cuneatus. And we'll talk about that at the very end as to what they innervate. So these are going to be lower. Oh, sorry. We already did. These are going to be your lower body and legs. And this one's going to be your upper body and arms. Again, anything lower limbs with T6. So dorsal root, it's going to go up to the, through the fasciculus gracilis up to the medulla where it's going to meet uh, nucleus gracilis and nucleus. So up and innervates here, it's still going to be on the ipsilateral medulla. It's going to be on the same side. Once it innervates here at the nucleus, cuneatus, or gracilis, depending on where the receptor is from, it's going to decussate in the medulla, so it's going to cross, and it's going to ascend contralaterally. And it's going to ascend contralaterally in the medial luminiscus pathway. And that will go until the thalamus, and the ventral posterior lateral nucleus. So at the VPL, it's a third innervation, and then that will continue up to the postcentral gyrus. There's another picture that probably will help you understand if you're still confused. Um, so a lesion that affects at A, B, or C, it's going to be contralateral and below because everything below that is going to be affected on the opposite side. And if you're lesioned here, it's going to be ipsilateral and below, so the same side. So just know, depending on where you are, if you have decussated or not. So this is what I was kind of trying to say. Um, so you have anything below T6 and down, that's the lower limb, right? So your first neuron comes in, it's going to go up the track of the fasciculus uh, gracilis. So it's going to go up, up, up until it meets its second neuron, which is the nucleus. So this one might be better. So you're going to come here, go up to the fasciculus gracilis, continue going up, up, up until you hit the second neuron, which is 
your gracilis nucleus. And then you're going to decussate cross with the internal arcuate fibers, which Pete always used to get me on all the time when he used to ask me questions about this. Um, that's where the crossing of the second neuron occurs, and then it continues up um, its same path of either your cuneatus nucleus um, up to your VPL. And if you're above T5 or T5 and up, you're going to basically then go to your fasciculus cuneatus. So that one will be this way. So that's what I was trying to explain. That lower motor is going to go through this, upper motor, or upper than T5, it's going to go through that. So, and know that it's the internal arcuate fibers that it's crossing through. So if you have a lesion here after T5, um, it's going to be ipsilateral and below the lesion. So it's going to affect anything below that lesion as far as uh, dorsal column tracks that are affected. Because if I cut this off, I can't get anything below it to go up. Okay, so... The spinal thalamic tract is basically A delta or C fibers. Again, your receptor, and it goes through the dorsal root ganglion. Um, here, it's going to stay on the same side. Again, that's the second innervation. Oh, and the spinal thalamic tract basically does your pain and temperature. Um, and I kind of just saw the first day thing today where it broke down lateral and anterior. I haven't broken it down into lateral and anterior, but the lateral one is pain and temperature and the anterior one is crude touch and pressure, um, which I didn't kind of, I've seen it before, but I had never really paid attention. But then there's located like two different spots. So we'll cover that in a second. But um, essentially it's going to go one or two segments. So once your receptor, it goes to the dorsal root ganglion, and it's going to go one or two segments above or below in the Lasaurus tract. So this is where it can be one or two segments up or below um, the dorsal root ganglia. And then, oh, so from the dorsal root goes to your dorsal horn, and then it can affect um, dorsal horn one or two segments above or below. And that's right after that, it's going to cross and it goes up, and that's where it becomes your spinal thalamic tract. Until this portion where it crosses, it does not become. It's not your spinal thalamic, but it becomes your spinal thalamic once it crosses. And, and then it's going to, third innervation again will be at the VPL and the thalamus, and then it goes up to your postcentral gyrus. So again, it descends ipsilaterally to the dorsal columns, Yeah, it goes to the dorsal root ganglion to the spinal cord. It ips ipsilateral to the gray matter, one or two tracks above or below. And then that's where it's decussating at the anterior white commissure. Um, that's where it crosses. There's a better picture of that. And then it'll ascend contralaterally to the VPL. That's what I was trying to say. So any lesions on the contralateral side basically or on the spinal thalamic track, A, B, C, D, it will be contralateral and below the lesion. Anything above that is okay. Everything is still intact. So here's a better picture, which the ones that I really like are basically your pain and temperature. It's going to go to your dorsal column. Um, and then this one doesn't really show the, the Lasaurus track, but uh, it shows you that it crosses, the axons cross and the a ventral white commissure below the central canal, and then it goes to your spinal thalamic tract essentially, and then all the way up to the VPL. So, if you have any sort of lesions here, um, it's gonna are contralateral and one to segments below the lesion. So the that exact segment lesion is fine, but anything contralateral one to two segments below is gonna be affected because. Again, there's still pain sensories that can go one to two tracks up. That's why this little section is unaffected. All right. So this is the last one, um, and this is not really even 
covered in first aid, but unless I didn't see it, but this is your spinal cerebellar tract. And the only thing you want to take from here is Clark's nucleus. So that's only for the lower limbs. So your muscle spindles will activate your dorsal root ganglion and then it'll ipsilateral side to your Clark's nucleus. And it continues straight to your dorsal spinal cerebellar tract all the way on the same side. So this is your unconscious proprioceptive. So a pathway to ipsilateral cerebellum. Um, so it's another path for the 185ers to take. But this is where the Clark's nucleus comes into play. And it basically is proprioception straight up. And it's on the same side. So I'm not really even going to spend that much time on it. So if you're looking at a cutout or a histo slide, um, basically you're going to see that this is your dorsal column here and you have your fasciculus uh, gracilis, so L for lower body, and then the cuneatus has a U for the upper body. Um, so that's more medial and lateral. And then your, your spinal lateral spinal thalamic tract which does your pain and temperature. And then there's this anterior spinal thalamic tract, which does crude touch and pressure. And then descending, because these are going up, these are coming down. That's going to be your lateral corticospinal tract, which basically does your voluntary mo motor movements. And they're right here. And you have an anterior corticospinal tract, which is down here, which again does voluntary movements. So, all right, so this is basically a slide that if you want to spend time on, you can, but it has all the tracks put together. Um, obviously, your purple one is going to be your dorsal column. The tan or orangish color will be your, uh, pretty sure that's your corticospinal tract. Um, and... This, the blue one is your spinal thalamic tract. So this is basically a hemi section. It's called the brown Sequard syndrome. So it's, <laughs> we're going to basically talk about a hemi section at T10 in this case. Um, so what is going to happen here? So your corticospinal tract is basically going to cause spastic weakness, ipsilateral and below the below the lesion. So anything below an ipsilateral to the side is going to be having spastic weakness. Your spinal thalamic tract, since it's crossing, it's going to be pain, loss of pain and temperature contralateral and below the lesion. So it's not going to affect the T10 level, but slightly contralateral to the T12, it's going to basically affect contralaterally. And your dorsal column, since it's T10, it's going to be your fasciculus gracilis. So you lose vibratory sense ipsilateral and below the lesion because you're doing hemisection at T10. So anything below that, you will lose that dorsal column, essentially. Um, and then you, you still have ipsilateral loss of uh, sensation at the level. So at the level of the lesion, you're going to have ipsilateral flaccid paralysis and loss of pain and temperature on just that side right here. So that's essentially what brown sequard is. So before we move on, do you guys have any questions, anything you want me to go over again? Sorry, I probably wasn't the best review, but. No, for brown sequard, whenever I see a vignette where I know they're trying to confuse you, all I like to remember is pain and temp, contralateral, everything else is interesting. <clears throat> but you just got to know that's one to two segments below, so mm -hmm. that's the Le Shower's track. All right, so we're going to talk about shock. Uh, <clears throat> So this is basically a life-threatening fall in blood pressure with poor tissue perf uh, perfusion. So there's some ways that you can get it as you have a low cardiac output. So that's due to either a loss of contractility or you have a low intravascular volume. And then obviously peripheral vasodilation is another way that you can also lose blood pressure um, or have a fall in blood pressure. So 
So there's four types of shock that we're going to talk about. Cardiogenic, hypovolemic, and distributive, and then obstructive. So the cardiogenic, obviously, is something to do with the cardiac disorder, and that causes a fall in the cardiac output. Hypovolemic is basically when you have a fall in the intravascular volume, and this um, fall in the cardiac output, such as hemorrhage. And then distributive is peripheral vasodilation. So you can see this in patients who have septic shock or anaphylactic shock. And then obstructive kind of gives it away. It's obstructive, but we'll talk about that more so in a few minutes. And there are different treatments for different types of shock. So most of that is determined by history, but conditions where it's unclear etiology, you need to use the swan gans catheter. So in this slide here, you see the use of um, basically the swan's gans catheter will be measure uh, your right atrium pressure, your left your right ventricle pressure, your pulmonary artery pressure, and then it can also be used to um, do a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which is a good approximation of what the left atrial pressure is. So in mitral stenosis, for example, your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be greater than your um, left ventricular end diastolic pressure. So um, typically your left ventricular pressure and your wedge pressure have to, have to be the same, and they're usually the same. Um, but if they're not, it's a good indication of some sort of a problem. But so let's talk about these specific kinds of shock and um, go through these. Oh, sorry. One other thing, the Swans GANS catheter can also help you uh, get, calculate cardiac output. It can also help you uh, calculate um as we are uh systemic, systemic vascular, vascular resistance yeah, systemic vascular resistance yeah <clears throat> so you can calculate the cardiac output using the fick equation um using the swans gans catheter because uh does anybody know the fick equation so, um, mean arterial pressure is cardiac output times svr so the fick equation is your cardiac output <laughs> Your heart rate equals the O2 consumption yeah. over um, over the arterial O2 minus the venous O2. Um, sorry. So essentially, sorry, I'm not going to write it all out, but that's what I was going to say. Arterial O2 and then the venous O2. So your O2 consumption you can use with a chart. They have well, it's equivalent to your body size, so there's a conversion charge for it. The atrial O2 is basically your O2 stat when you do a finger probe, and then the venous O2 can come. You can calculate that via the Swan scans catheter. So you can use the thick equation to calculate your cardiac output. All right, so that was just an extra information that I learned today, which was kind of cool. So let's talk about these specific ones. So we're going to talk about cardiogenic, hypovolemic, and distributive first, and then we'll talk about obstructive after. So cardiogenic shock, essentially its hallmark is you're going to see low cardiac output. So that's the hallmark for cardiogenic shock. And you're also going to see high cardiac pressures. So your filling pressures are going to be high. So this is when you know your left ventricle is not working. Um, so it's commonly seen in large MIs or heart failures that have depressed uh, left ventricular ejection fraction. Um, why is SVR high in this patient with a low cardiac output? It's your... It's trying to increase the afterload to make up for the low cardiac output. Right. It's your uh, system sympathetic response to the low cardiac output, essentially. That's why this is high. And right, Pete's right in saying that it's trying to make up for the low cardiac output. And that's how your body compensates. So you're probably going to see in cardiogenic shock increase in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. But your cardiac output's going to be low. Um, and your SVR is going to be high. In hypovolemic shock, it's basically due to poor fluid intake, or you have a GI loss, such as nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. 
or there's high fever with insensible loss in the lungs or the major cause hemorrhage. Um, so this is a condition where you're going to see low cardiac output and low cardiac pressures. So your pulmonary capillary wedge pressures or other pressures are going to be low. Again, your systemic vascular resistance is high because your body is clamping the arterioles to raise the SVR to make up for the loss of cardiac output. So essentially, this is why you're going to see cardiac output low and systemic vascular resistance being high. And in distributive shock, it's the hallmark is low systemic vascular resistance. So in all sorts of distributive shock, you're going to see a low systemic vascular resistance. Um, and this is due to either diffuse vasodilation or endothelial dysfunction. So the way you can think about it is basically your fluids are leaking out into your vascular space from the vascular space into the tissue beds. And most common types where you see distributive is sepsis. So your cardiac output is increased in most cases um, because you're decreasing the vascular resistance. So it increases the afterload and in the left ventricle and thus your cardiac output is high. So this chart uh, helps you. If I didn't have markings on it, it would be better. Um, so in cardiogenic, are you seeing a decrease in cardiac output, an increase in the SVR, but you see an increase in all sorts of your right atrial pressure, right ventricular pressure, so all your cardiac um, pressures are high. But in hypovolemic, yes, you have a low cardiac output, you still have a high systemic vascular resistance, but your cardiac outputs are also all low. So this is where your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So this is how you differentiate between these two. And in distributive, either you have a high cardiac output and the hallmark again is low systemic vascular resistance. And um, you, your pressures can vary um, to be either low or not changed at all. So physical exam wise, why do you see cold and clammy skid in patients with cardiogenic or hypovolemic shock is because you have a high SVR and a low cardiac output. So your arterioles are clamped down and you also already have a low cardiac output will lead to poor perfusion of the skin, especially in hands. So most of these patients will have cold and clammy hands. Um, and then in distributive, they're warm because you have a low resistance but an increased cardiac output. So you have low resistance to flow and how high output, thus you're gonna have a flushed or warm skin. So that's why you're seeing the difference in the skin manifestations in these different um, subtypes. And then the other things that they could possibly give you is JVP, um, which is gonna be high in cardiogenic shock, or it's gonna be up in cardiogenic shock and that's due to the high right atrial pressure, and then pulmonary uh, rails, and that's due to the high left atrial pressure, and that's also seen in cardiogenic shock. So where the pressures are high, you're going to see other symptoms that could possibly give you. Now moving on to obstructive shock, it's basically an obstruction of blood flow from the heart. So here you're going to see a low cardiac output and a high systemic vascular resistance. Um, and basically your PCW, uh, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is variable. It could change, um, because your contractility is normal in these patients. They have a low cardiac output despite having a normal contractility. So in cardiac tamponade, it's basically a normal heart function, but because the fluid is surrounding the heart, you have a low end cardiac output. And pulmonary embolism or tension pneumothorax, again, the high pressures are on the inside of the thorax. And, um, so it impairs the ability to basically fill. So your cardiac output is going to be low in tension pneumothorax. And in pulmonary embolism, it's just harder for the blood flow from the right to the left. So that's why you get a decrease in the cardiac output. Okay. So treatment-wise for these guys, 
in cardiogenic shock, obviously it's due to the fall in contractility. So you're going to give them ionotropes to increase their contractility. And that's such as melanone or dobutamine are some of the drugs that you could use there. Um, in hypovolemic patients or patients with hypovolemic shock, you're going to add volume. So that could be either blood transfusion or IV fluids. In distributive shock, the primary problem is vasodilation. So you want to treat these patients with a vasopressor um, to cause vasoconstriction. So phenylephrine, epinephrine, or norepinephrine are options to give. And then obstructive shock, basically you want to relieve, relieve the obstruction to get normal blood flow. And, um, so this is a basically a flow chart that you can use. Um, if the SVR is high, then you can go further and, okay, measure the pressures. If the pressures are high, you can say it's a cardiogenic shock. The pressures are low, hypovolemic shock. And if the SVR is low, which is hallmark for distributive. So it kind of helps you if you am doing that. So any questions about shock? The distributive used to just, that was the one that used to be called septic, right? Yeah, this one is the one that's going to be sepsis or anaphylaxis. But the hallmark is low as low as here, yeah. But your cardiac output's normal. So I got three questions for you guys. So during brain surgery, uh, well, during which the patient remained conscious, a part of the uh, dorsal column in the medial lumiscal system was exposed and stimulated. Which of the following sensations might the patient most likely experience? Feeling as if his fingers are warming up, feeling as if somebody, something were touching his index finger, a tingling sensation, or mild pain, but he is unable to explain exactly where it hurts. Uh, C. I was going for C. Divya, what'd you say? Um, to say it. I said B, but I don't know. Okay. Correct. Oh. Um, so the answer is B because the dorsal column medial lumiscus system is sensory pathway that transmits conscious proprioceptive information with fine gradation, such as fine touch on the index finger to the cerebral cortex. So the brain interprets any signals coming along the labeled lines, the nerves that carry the message from the sensory organ to the cortex. Um, answer so we C. Uh, tingling are all sensory modalities are thus proceeded in the spinal thalamic or anterior lateral system. Mm -hmm. Good job, Divya. Mm -hmm. All right. A 33-year-old man, male patient, returns from a six-year tour of Navy duty where he was stationed in Thailand. The patient presents with impairment of the proprioception and vibratory sense along with loss of deep tendon reflex. When the patient walks or stands, he maintains a wide base gait due to his sensory ataxia. When asked to stand feet together with his eyes closed, he displays Romberg sign. Um, he is diagnosed with Tavis dorsalis due to tertiary neurosyphilis. What is the most likely location of this lesion? Hanging out too many Thai whorehouses. Basically. Anybody know? Yes. So obviously you guys know your stuff. Um, it's, this is the answer choices. If any, um, if anybody needs me to explain the other ones, I can, if not, we can move. Tavis dorsalis. Yeah. So I have a thing of Tavis dorsalis caused by tertiary syphilis and it causes basically demyelination of the dorsal columns and roots. And so you can also get Romberg sign positive, which what he has. All right, and the last review question. <clears throat> a 57-year-old male patient presents with progressive weakness of the upper and lower limbs. Atrophy of the muscles of the upper limb is observed. Neurologic examination reveals slightly spastic spasticity of the leg and generalized hyperreflexia. Patient displays Babinski signs in both lower extremities. All sensory modalities are intact and cerebral tests 
or cerebellar tests are normal. An MRI scan uh, confirms the patient suffers from ALS. Which of the following structures is most likely lesion in this disorder? The ventral column and... Okay. Corticospinal tract. Okay, what do you say, David? A. a. Tulsi, do you want to make a guess? Um, I was guessing A. <laughs> a is the right answer. Good job. So ALS is characterized lesion of the corticospinal tract as well as lower motor neurons in the ventral horns of the spinal cord. So you get a characteristic upper and lower motor neuron lesion. And that will be all for me. Any questions, guys? 